Uh, this the topic which I, I was going to talk about is pretty broad. It's uh, about democracy and markets and the way the world order is evolving. Uh, there is a kind of a standard version on this, which I won't waste much time on. You've heard it and seen it often. Uh, the standard version is that there's a sharp break taking place in the nature of world order. There's a new era opening, uh, which is an era of great promise for the growth of markets and uh, um, growth of democracy. Um, the United States has won a major victory. The Cold War, say, 1989, definitive end, symbolizes the break and the uh, uh, new opening. Uh, the, there are other processes. The uh, process of uh, globalization has changed the nature of the world radically, and uh, 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 there's a, a minimization of the state and an increase in market uh, relations and so on. That's the general picture. Uh, it's even, a, uh, even formalized as the Clinton Doctrine. Uh, the uh, National Security Advisor a couple of years ago, Anthony Lake, who's sort of the intellectual of the administration, uh, presented the Clinton Doctrine as uh, uh, expressing these views. His basic thesis was that <clears throat> until uh, the end of the Cold War, uh, the United States had been engaged in uh, containing the threat to market democracy, but now that threat is suppressed and we can now go on to enlarge the reach of market democracy as, uh, as we've been intending to do all along and are now free to do. Uh, I think there's a good deal of reason for skepticism about the every aspect of this picture, uh, every aspect. Uh, some of the aspects of the picture are just flat wrong uh, by uh, everyone's agreement. Others are at least debatable. Uh, so it takes a minimization of the state. One of the main features of contemporary doctrine is that uh, the day of the large active state is over and that we have to minimize the state and move to more market principles. Uh, you can get an estimate as to the accuracy of that in the latest uh, uh, annual volume of the World Bank uh, uh, Development Report. They every year come out with their flagship publication. Uh, a lot of fanfare and so on. It's supposed to represent mainstream economic thinking. Kind of interesting because it rapidly oscillates from one year to the next, which may tell you something. Uh, this year is about uh, the state and markets, and they just they give some data on the uh, ratio of state expenditures to GNP worldwide. And uh, it shows what people should have known. Uh, it's differentiated. There are some areas of the world where, in fact, the state is being minimized, that is, reducing relative to GNP, namely those areas that have been under the influence and control of the international financial institutions in the United States, uh, sub-Saharan Africa and Latin America. In those areas, in fact, uh, state expenditures relative to GNP are low and declining, and they're also all economic disasters. Uh, in the rich countries, uh, OECD countries, uh, that's the place where the ratio of state expenditures to GNP is the highest, and it's been going up. It went up quite sharply in the 1980s. It's still going up, though less sharply. Uh, in the Asian growth area, which has been essentially out of World Bank uh, U.S. domination, uh, state expenditures relative to GNP have been going up. Uh, they're not as high as the rich countries, but going up. So what you do have, you, there is a picture, uh, namely the place where the international institutions, the World Bank, the IMF, uh, U.S. government, in the areas where they can pretty much control policy, the state is indeed declining. It was always lower. It's getting still lower. Uh, and in fact, there's a, a poverty is increasing in absolute terms as well as relative terms. And in general, there's an economic disaster except for a small sector of the population. Uh, in the rich countries, exactly the opposite is happening. Um, one might want to draw some conclusions from that. The World Bank doesn't. Uh, but anyway, those are the data about minimization of the state. Uh, what about markets? Is this a period of uh, growth of markets? Well, no. And in fact, it's known not to be. Uh, so if you look at uh, the technical literature by uh, uh, in, uh, you know, uh, international economists and so on, they point out 
I'll quote the, one of the major scholarly studies of this by an economist of the GATT Secretariat, that the last 25 years have been a period of sustained assault on free markets uh, led by the rich countries, the OECD countries, uh, with the United States far in the lead, uh, Reaganite uh, uh, anti-market measures. Uh, he estimates at about three times the level of those of uh, uh, other uh, OECD countries, uh, and they're very severe. Uh, this, incidentally, is quite well known. Uh, you read, say, the Foreign Affairs uh, a review of every year. They have a review, uh, uh, the review of the decade in 1990, reviewed the last decade by their editor. You know, this is the major establishment journal. Uh, pointed out that the uh, Reaganites, uh, quote them, that the Reaganites had led the uh, greatest swing toward protectionism since the 1930s. Uh, they had shifted the United States from being a supporter of multilateral free trade to being its leading challenger, uh, and uh, the facts do bear that out. Uh, the Reagan administration, in fact, essentially doubled uh, protection for U.S. markets by one or another device. Uh, they were more protectionist than all post-war administrations combined, and in fact, they boasted about this to the business community. They didn't keep it secret. Uh, and that's only one part of their radical market interference. They also poured state subsidies into uh, high technology industry under the usual military cover, and in many other ways uh, made sure that that uh, at least wealthy sectors in the United States weren't going to have to face market discipline. Uh, and that was part of a sustained assault against markets uh, all over, from the rich countries all over the world. On the other hand, it is differentiated. The poorer countries, particularly those that were under the influence and domination of the international financial institutions in the United States, the ones subject to what's called the Washington Consensus, which tells you where it's coming from, uh, they, they did indeed uh, uh, open themselves up to uh, markets uh, with consequences that you can observe. Mexico was uh, the most recent example. Uh, Case after case is a disaster for most of the population, but it's true that markets have been increasing there. Uh, there is also further differentiation. Uh, the last 25 years have been a period of uh, restrictive measures on trade, but great liberalization of finance. That's a radical change. That really is a change, and a significant change in world order, but it didn't have anything to do with the Cold War. It took place uh, starting 60s, but radically in the early 1970s, and that led to huge changes. So f for the first time in modern history, financial flows uh, have first of all been astronomical and very rapid, and also essentially uncorrelated to the real economy. Uh, so before this period, uh, say 1970, uh, about 90% uh, of the capital interactions in foreign exchange were related to trade uh, and investment, that is, the real economy. About 10 percent were speculative. Uh, by now, it's about 5 percent related to the real economy and about 95 percent speculative. Uh, the speculative flows are extremely rapid. About 80 percent of them have a turnaround time of a week, and most of that is a day. Some of it is even minutes, uh, and it's astronomical. Uh, it's just shot out of sight. Uh, by now, it's over a trillion dollars a day, uh, totally, you know, outweighing uh, the uh, uh, resources of even rich countries, even uh, uh, the European Union, and so on. So that's a big change. Uh, uh, but uh, and that liberalization of capital has increased, but restriction on trade has increased along with it. Uh, that correlation is well known. Uh, it's not a perfect correlation, but it's a relationship. In fact, the whole post-war economic system was built on that relationship. Uh, when the United States and Britain designed the post-war economic system back in you know, 1945, uh, what's called the Bretton Woods system, it was designed to uh, liberalize trade and restrict finance. So the, the system that was designed by Harry Dexter White and John Maynard Keynes and the rest of them, uh, was designed specifically to try to increase trade. They thought that would be a good thing. 
uh, and in order to do that, to restrict capital. Uh, so their countries had capital controls. In fact, the uh, OECD countries, the rich ones, maintained capital controls into the 1980s. Uh, the, there are countries that didn't, like Latin America. Uh, they have, they're very free and open to international capital uh, and sub-Saharan Africa. So they have plenty of capital. They don't have capital controls. Uh, and uh, uh, you can see it. Uh, the famous debt crisis uh, hit Latin America and did not hit East Asia, primarily for that reason. Uh, as, uh, ca the capital flowed out of Latin America to New York banks and uh, to London and so on. The rich people sent their money elsewhere, in, in other words, uh, instead of investing it domestically. And the Latin American debt is not very different from capital flight. In other words, if they kept their money inside, the famous debt wouldn't have, would barely be there. And that indeed is what happened in East Asia, which did have capital controls. Uh, it's all, it was understood by Keynes, White, and other designers of the world order from 1945 that these two things were generally an inverse relationship. As you liberalized capital, you tended to restrict trade and conversely. And that remains true. Uh, generally speaking, it's been true the last 25 years very radical liberalization of financial capital and the period of restrictiveness of trade. Even the so-called trade agreements are, in fact, uh, not free trade agreements. They have very severe uh, protectionist elements. I'll come back to that if there's time. Anyhow, the first picture about minimization of the state is true in a very differentiated fashion. It's not true for the rich countries. It's not true for East Asia. In fact, the opposite is true. But it is true for the poorer countries and increasing for the poorer countries. And that, in fact, is part of the Washington consensus. That's part of what's imposed on them. Now, actually, it's a little more nuanced than that, because another recent change uh, is that internal to the rich countries, especially the United States and England, uh, there is, there's an analog to that. So the state has not declined relative to GNP in England and the United States under Thatcher and Reagan, but it's shifted. Uh, it's shifted. Uh, to more and more service to the wealthy and less and less service to the rest of the population, which is the domestic analog to the international system. So yes, there is liberalization for the poor, like, you know, seven-year-old children have to learn responsibility and, you know, get out of that cycle of dependency and face market discipline and so on, but not rich people. They have to be protected from market discipline. They have to be protected by uh, socialization of risk and socialization of cost, uh, along with, of course, privatization of profit and management. But they don't want to face, uh, they have to stay on the cycle of dependency. Uh, and that's become very striking uh, in the Reagan and Thatcher years. Uh, the, uh, so after 17 years of Thatcher, uh, state expenditures relative to GNP were exactly what they were when she came in. Uh, but the ch shift in the way the state was functioning was quite substantial. So there was a very sharp increase in poverty, an increase in millions of children in poverty, hunger that hadn't been seen for 50, 60 years, childhood diseases that had been over declining and essentially overcome are now back. Uh, and it's a kind of a Dick Dickensian picture. Uh, at the same time, state expenditures are being used to uh, in fact, illegally, they keep having scandals to, uh, you know, uh, uh, subsidize uh, aerospace exports and so on and so forth. That's a shift. Same here. I mean, we're all familiar with it, so I don't have to talk about it. Uh, but there's been a very sharp shift internally in the United States. In fact, you see it quite strikingly by looking at, uh, everyone knows that should know at least, that the United States has by far the highest level of inequality of any industrial society. And in fact, it's been, after having declined from about 1945 till around 1970, it's been increasing. And it's now back to what it was around the 1920s uh, and still going up. Uh, but that uh, picture is not, uh, it, 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 it's true, but it's, again, good to disaggregate it, break it up into its components. Uh, the uh, participation in the economy uh, what's called the market economy, but that's misleading. But what's participation in the economy leads to a certain distribution of income. 
okay? So, you know, you have a job and spend money and so on. That leads to a certain distribution of income. Then comes a second factor, a social policy, which is taxes and transfers, okay? So it's called government action, but in fact it's social policy. Uh, and the more democratic the society, the more people participate. Uh, so when, uh, if you look at, if you compare the United States with other industrial societies in market outcomes, uh, what's the inequality there? Well, it's about the same as other societies. So the United States ranks along with the other industrial societies in terms of distribution of income uh, from market outcomes. If you add the effect of social policy, the United States diverges radically. That's where the divergence comes in. So you take into account taxes and transfers, you find the inequality growing very sharply because that's the nature of social policy in the United States, increasingly in England, uh, and that's the fake Reagan-Thatcher revolution. It's carried, they're not, it's not totally there, but they sort of symbolize it. Uh, well, okay, those are decisions. You know, they're not laws of nature, as you can see from the fact that they don't happen in other similar societies. Uh, but this is real. And it's, in fact, a domestic variant of the international picture that I just briefly sketched. Uh, there couldn't be a better symbol of this than uh, Newt Gingrich, who's the leading, you know, no, no one is more passionate about the need to break the, uh, you know, cycle of dependency and learn responsibility and all this sort of thing, but not the people in the district that he represents. Uh, Cook County, Georgia, a very rich uh, suburb of Atlanta, uh, he manages to maintain the record for bringing federal subsidies to his district. Uh, he's maintained it for some years uh, because there, the rich folk in Cook County, they have to be, be saved from market discipline. They have to maintain the cycle of dependency. Uh, just, uh, the last, uh, just as the last budget went through, he managed to sneak in another half billion dollars for his favorite local charity, uh, Lockheed Martin, uh, which uh, uh, has corporate headquarters down there. Uh, and, uh, and that's standard. I mean, this is like, you know, sort of symbolizes it, but the, poly but the picture is quite general. Uh, and it's a picture you see all around you. You walk a couple of blocks towards Roxbury, you'll see it. Uh, walk a couple of blocks towards you know, the financial centers, you'll see the other side of it. Uh, and, uh, and that's happening on a global scale as well. So uh, again, in Latin America, there has been, an, which has been subjected to the Washington consensus and is quite open to international capital flows and so on, uh, there's an absolute increase in poverty uh, with only two exceptions, uh, Colombia and Chile. Uh, Colombia, it's largely because of the the drug-based economy is a considerable part of that, and also because it maintains capital controls. In Chile, it's because, contrary to what you read, they have not accepted the Washington Consensus. Uh, so it's not a free market society. Uh, they, for example, do impose uh, controls on short-term speculative capital flows, uh, and in fact, their major export, copper, uh, most of it comes from a nationalized company, you know, which is quite efficient and so on. So they've managed some sort of nuanced form of development, whatever you want to call it, and though they're not tigers in the Asian sense, they're not disasters in the Mexican sense. Uh, well, that picture seems fairly general, uh, and it's enough to make one think, at least, about the uh, sort of mantra, you know, that we're entering into a new period of uh, markets and minimization of state and so on and so forth. I think if you look closely, it's not that. Uh, what about democracy? Is it a new era of democracy? Uh, the result of the victory of the United States in the Cold War. Well, uh, you can look at that too. Uh, uh, for one thing, notice that to the extent that there is an extension of market principles, there's a decline in democracy. Those two things go hand in hand. Uh, when you minimize the state, you don't eliminate decision making. You just transfer it. So it's not being made in the state system, it's being made somewhere else. And where it's be uh, the, the, you know, the story is this is a transfer of power to the people, but that's not even a joke, so we don't have to waste any time on that. Uh, it's a transfer of power to, to the private sector, undoubtedly, but that's not the people. That's uh, the highly concentrated power system within the private sector. 
Uh, so in fact, it's a transfer of power from uh, the state system where there's whatever degree of participation there may be, you know, a, a lot in some countries, less in other countries, but some degree of participation, and in principle, a lot of participation, in fact, full participation in principle. There's a transfer from that system to a system of unaccountable private power uh, where in principle there is no participation. So you and I in principle have nothing to say about the decisions of General Electric and Microsoft. You know, that's a matter of law and principle. Uh, unless you happen to own some stock, then you have as much say as the stock you own, uh, which means if you're in the top few percentage of the population, you own most of the stock and you have most of the say. Uh, but uh, there isn't even in principle, and these are unaccountable also. You also can't find out what they're doing. Uh, like you can't find, you can't read the, find the, out the books of uh, General Electric. That's a secret. So these are unaccountable private power. Uh, internally, they're essentially totalitarian. Uh, if you take a look at the structure of a corporation, it's about as close to the totalitarian model as anything human beings have devised, you know, with power vested at the top, orders going down stage by stage. If you're a middle-level manager, say, you take your orders from above and you hand them down below, as in totalitarian systems, say, Stalinist Russia, there's some interaction, you know, like nothing's totally rigid, uh, and other influences, but it's, a, as I say, about as close to the totalitarian ideal as humans have constructed, uh, and unaccountable, uh, and uh, that's where powers, that's where decisions are transferred. So to the extent that these processes are taking place, yeah, it's, a, it's an attack on democracy virtually by definition. Uh, and the efforts to move things in that direction are an attempt to increase that. Uh, but even beyond that, let's just take a look at democracy within the state sector, so formal democracy like voting rights and that kind of thing. Uh, here there's, it's a mixed story. Uh, so take, take the regions where the U.S has been influential. That's primarily the Western Hemisphere. That's the place to look to check the theory that there's been a victory for a democracy. We've been trying to contain threats to it. Now we enlarge its scope. So we can look at the Western Hemisphere. Well, that's been studied, studied rather well. There's good scholarship on it. Uh, the best scholarly work on the topic is uh, the most extensive, is, and it's good, is by uh, Thomas Carruthers is a Latin American specialist who has the advantage of uh, also writing from an insider's perspective uh, because he was in the Reagan administration in the State Department uh, working on democracy enhancement programs. That was the period of the great victory of democracy in Latin America. He was working on it in the middle and he's now writing about it as a scholar. And his review I think is basically accurate. Uh, he points out that there indeed was an increase in democracy formal democracy in, La in Latin America, and it was in inverse correlation to U.S. influence. That is, the greater the U.S. influence, the less the increase in democracy. So there was an increase in democracy in the southern cone, you know, South America, like Argentina, Brazil, Chile. Now, the Reagan administration opposed it, uh, but once it proved irresistible, they sort of went along with it and, in fact, even took credit for it. So in the regions of the least influence, uh, there was an extension of democracy. In the regions of the most influence, which is nearby, you know, traditional area of U.S. domination, the Caribbean, Central America, uh, that's where there was least increase in democracy. Uh, there were formal democracies, but as Carruthers puts it, I'll quote him, uh, the, on the United States would only tolerate uh, top-down forms of democracy, of democratic change, that maintained the traditional structures of power with which the United States has long been allied and maintained the basic order of uh, uh, basic, uh, fundamentally of quite an undemocratic societies. Yeah, that's correct. If you look closely at the region, you'll find out that that's what happened. So yes, there was a kind of a victory of democracy in, which was substantial in the regions of less U.S. influence, was less in the regions of more U.S. influence, and in fact maintained the structures of the undemocratic societies in the same power systems, crucially. Uh, that was a crucial part of the move toward democracy. Uh, I think you find, again, an internal analog to that. Come back to it if there's time. Uh, the, uh, the, the model that was given when Anthony Lake 
announced the Reagan, the Clinton doctrine, you know, the great new doctrine, uh, he gave an example, a prize example, to illustrate how it was going to work, uh, the new victories of markets and democracies. The example he gave was Haiti. And it's a good example because the recent developments there are post-Cold War, so one can't give any arguments about this was a reflection of the Cold War or whatever. Actually, I don't think those arguments work very well for earlier periods either, but, but here it, the question is moot because the events in question are after the end of the Cold War. And Haiti was offered as the example of the our achievements and the promise of bringing democracy and markets to a benighted world. So that's a good one to look at. Uh, and then when you look at it, you find it illustrates all the phenomena I've just been describing quite accurately, I think. Uh, when uh, in, uh, there was a democratic election, first democratic election in Haiti in 1990. The United States did not oppose it. The United States had its own candidate, Mark Bazan, a uh, World Bank uh, official. And it took for granted, everyone took for granted he was going to win. He had all the resources, he had all the rich people working for him, and so on. So if everyone figured he'd be a shoe in So that looked like an okay election, uh, maintained the top-down structure of power. Well, to everyone's surprise, he didn't win. In fact, he got smashed. He got 14% of the vote, uh, and two-thirds of the vote went to a candidate nobody thought about, namely Jean-Bertrand Aristide, uh, who was supported by a something that no one had noticed, namely a huge popular grassroots movement uh, in the poor, in the peasant society, in the urban slums. Nobody pays any attention to those people, uh, but they had been developing lively organizations and grassroots movements and so on, and a very li vibrant civil society, uh, sufficient so they even swept their own president into office with two-thirds of the vote and no resources. That's pretty remarkable. In fact, that is probably the most dramatic victory of democracy in the Western Hemisphere in quite a long time. In fact, maybe ever, you could argue, uh, but or not just the Western Hemisphere. It was a pretty dramatic event, rarely takes place. Uh, and that was an election, real democratic election, post-Cold War. Uh, the United States did react. It was extremely hostile. The United States moved at once to undermine the democratic government, cut off aid, except for opponents of of the president, uh, supported bus business elements that were trying to undermine him. Uh, the, this is despite the fact that his policies were quite successful. In fact, mildly reformist policies, so successful that even the World Bank and the IMF uh, were impressed and were giving loans and so on, but the United States was dedicated to undermining it. Uh, you could see the dedication rather strikingly by looking at refugee policy, which is quite re revealing in this case. Uh, during the period of the brutal dictatorship that the U.S. had backed, there was an enormous flow of refugees from Haiti. People were fleeing from terror and poverty. Uh, they were turned back by force uh, illegally. This is in radical violation of the U.N. Declaration of Human Rights, but the Carter administration and the Duvalier dictatorship made an agreement, which was then extended by Reagan, to forcefully return people fleeing from Haiti and not to grant them asylum. And that continued until the democratic election. At that point, the refugee flow stopped, virtually stopped. There was a trickle. And in fact, it reversed because people started going back. The Haitians started returning in this period of hopefulness. Uh, and uh, uh, U.S. refugee policy also reversed. Uh, it uh, reversed uh, uh, towards granting asylum to refugees. In fact, asylum requests were granted at 50 times the rate during the democratic interlude as before, because now they were fleeing a democratic government, not a murderous dictatorship, so therefore they were real political refugees. A couple of months later, uh, just to dramatize the fact, a few months later there was a military coup. President Aristide was overthrown. U.S. refugee policy reversed. Uh, now they were people were re again fleeing from brutal terror. It was pretty bad. I was there for a little while myself, but you didn't even have to be there to know how bad it was. It was awful. People were fleeing from poverty, terror, torture, and they were forced back. The United States imposed and again, obviously, illegal blockade uh, to force them back, and that's still going on. A couple hundred were just forced back uh, uh, a few weeks ago. Well, that symbolizes what happened. Uh, when the military coup took place, 
uh, the United States made the right noises. It was the Bush administration about saying how bad this is and we're in favor of democracy, but they moved at once to support the military coup. The Organization of American States called an embargo uh, 